Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Republican and Democratic lawmakers join us in studio to discuss the major issues of the ongoing legislative session and just how long that session will go on. A legislative overview next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The state legislature is still in session with the battle over Medicaid expansion holding up a variety of other major issues including the budget and sales tax reform. Joining us now to talk about the session is Senate Majority Leader John McComish, Senate Minority Leader Leah Landrum-Taylor, House Speaker Pro Tem J.D. Mesnard, and House Minority Leader Chad Campbell. Good to have you all here for the entire program. Got a lot to discuss. Uh, let's start with Medicaid expansion. Where are we on this and are things progressing? Uh, no, is the short answer. Uh, there, there's a lot of conversation and, and that was a, you know, there is, there is progress of a sort in that we're talking, trying to sort out, but nobody has yet seen the path to victory, so to speak, where we can find a way to get this to a conclusion, whether it's pass it, whether it's not going to pass. Uh, uh, there seems to be just d division amongst, uh, amongst parties, particularly among the Republicans, uh, uh, and division amongst leadership, and, um, and then the, the governor is, is pretty single-minded, uh, um, and it's just been tough. We haven't found the pathway to, to a conclusion yet. The, the, the federal memo that the governor uh, kind of uh, released which I think the governor's office thought would be kind of a uh, you know, the smoking gun, if you will, the last hand nail uh, it, that would hammer this thing in. Why is that not good? Because basically what was outlined in that memo seems that there's only one option, according to the governor's office. And you know, when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, first of all, there's lots of lives that we're talking about, and that can be affected if we do not go forward in making sure that the Medicaid expansion does take place. But there's also a strong economic um, side, a downfall that can happen. And when you look at the rural areas and hospitals that could shut down and, you know, just it, it just spirals on and on and on. At, at some point, uh, when is it going to be a give in there? We have, we've got to move forward with the with the Medicaid expansion, and quite frankly, there's numbers of ways you know that 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 can occur. I mean, if it has to go about being a special session within the session, mm -hmm. because at this point, it's more than a cat stare happening right now. Yeah. What, what, what is what is holding things up? What what are the arguments against this, and how strong are those arguments? And could there be some compromise in there? Sure. Well. I think it's difficult sometimes to find compromise if it's, it's a, a tug of war. And unfortunately on this issue, that's sort of what it's become. Uh, I would say that the governor has outlined her vision pretty clearly. I think, uh, I'm just, I'm not going to speak for the Senate, but I guess that the Senate is mostly there. And the House is really where, where the, the battle is raging. And the real reason is because there are arguments for and against. And there will be consequences, whatever direction we choose to go. What yeah, and, and I just want to add. Go ahead. I think uh, most of the arguments against Medicaid expansion are, are ideological, though. It's as Leah pointed out, economically speaking, it's it's a no-brainer. You have to do this in terms of economic development. You have to do this in terms of keeping the hospitals, especially in rural Arizona, keeping their doors open. Um, there's a lot of reasons to do it. The only reason not to do it is if you're ideologically opposed to the Affordable Care Act. And one of the opponents this week basically admitted that that's the case. And, and this is one of the people who have been uh, pushing forth the, the abortion argument, Mr. Seal, and he admitted yesterday that the only reason he's doing that, because it's irrelevant to this argument, but the only reason he's doing this is because he's trying to kill Medicaid. So for all the reasons most opponents are throwing out there, they're not relevant, and it's an ideologically based argument, nothing you know, more. Throughout, throughout my tenure in the legislature, sometimes you see issues that become as big as this particular one in discussion. A lot of times it has to do, you know, financially. This is something where it's not going to hit our budget, um, our general fund, financially. So, I mean, we're just trying to figure out where are we going with all this. Well, you mentioned compromise, mm -hmm. and I think one of the difficulties of this is I don't see where there is compromise. You're either for it or against it. And I don't see there's any half measures or partial measures. You can't be, you, you know, we can't partially <coughs> expand Medicaid or, exactly. you, you know, right. that's it, the tug either, of war I was yes no. talking about. Yeah. And, and if you partially, if you do partially restore Medicaid, as some people have proposed, it's actually more expensive to the state to do that. Yes. So it's either it's either all yeah. or nothing. That's yeah. a great point. But I, I do want to say it is not it is not only ideology. There is a practical side uh, that you can argue against expansion. For instance, while the Supreme Court uh, sort of 
released us a little bit from the idea that we have to expand. That was a mandate under Obamacare that they released us from. They also have, it's a little bit grayer though once you do expand, if you can unexpand. And so if we start going down that road and we find out, you know, it's not working out like what we thought, we may be stuck. And, and that's a consideration that should be, uh, that should be given thought to. But, but then you have this, the whole argument, and, and again, after being around for 15 years, I mean, we've heard the argument about the uncompensated care, and we can't go down that road again. You know, hospitals are, are, are already struggling, and certainly many of the rural area hospitals, so if we were to not have the Medicaid expansion, then we'd be moving back into that um, very risky area of um, uncompensated care. And, and, you know, something hit me early on in session. We were actually discussing Medicaid expansion and appropriations but an informational hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, a ton of people came down to talk about why they were in favor of Medicaid expansion. Hospitals, business community, you name it, they were there. But there was one young lady who came down, and she's one of the few people, one of the few single childless adults that still gets coverage right now, the 50,000 or so that are getting coverage, that will lose that coverage at the end of this year if we don't restore Medicaid fully. And, and if she loses Medicaid, she will go blind. She has a chronic condition, a degeneration of her eyes, and, and she will go blind. And, and all the numbers we can throw out there, all the stats, everything else, that right there is the reason I want to pass Medicaid. And it's really the reason that keeps me up at night if we don't pass Medicaid. What's going on in the Senate? I, we, I, I was interested to hear that the battle is raging in the House. I thought the battle was raging in the Senate. I mean, <laughs> news to me. What's going on in the Senate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the battle is raging in the Senate. Uh, uh, and um, it's the same ideological discussions that, that we're having here. Uh, um, and the fact that there can't be any half measures, uh, and we're trying to figure that out. Do, do you, and how do you go about it? Do we, we could probably pass a bill out of the Senate that would include uh, Medicaid expansion, but if it's not gonna pass in the House, then why would we do that? Mm -hmm. So you need to, you, you need to get, it, it, before we do that, you need to get the House on board, and then you also can't forget about the governor. She has to, she has to be on board with whatever we do. And that's part of the hang-up. It's just a, it's a very complicated issue, and people have um, unfortunately drawn drawn lines in the sand on on both sides. It's that time of the year too when we have to take a look at the timeliness of getting a budget passed forward. Um, we're now approaching towards the uh, middle of May, and then that'll happen really quick if nothing happens next week, then the time clock will be ticking away. So, you know, we still have a responsibility, of a fiduciary responsibility to our various departments. We have to have a budget um, going forward. Think about the schools, school districts. There's contracts that have to be offered to the teachers, and they're dependent upon us getting this done. So we all, you know, it's, it, it gets exhausting getting to this point of the budget when we already know, you know, what needs to happen in the time frame of it. How much is this bogging <laughs> things down? Oh, it's the reason the session is bogged down. And, and I'd say, in some ways, rightly so, in that this is probably one of the biggest issues we face in some time and will face yes. uh, for the next several years. And so, yes, we're in May, and I know we all want to be done with session, but given the magnitude of the issue, we need to make sure it is fully vetted, it is fully discussed, and that we come up with something that makes sense. Is there, you mentioned the idea of, of unsecuring this or getting out of something that may not be where. What are the other arguments against sure. going into this agreement? Well, one thing that gets overlooked is that we're, we're talking really about two things that have been combined into one. And you have one, on the one hand, expansion, the idea of who is going to be covered. On the other hand, you have the mechanism for paying for it. And that, that hasn't been discussed a lot, but there is an assessment on ho hospitals that has been proposed. Um, and and there's some controversy with that because some would consider that a tax increase. And so in addition to the phil philosophy of whether or not you want to expand, it's, well, do I want to support a new tax? And if you're against that, then now these two issues have collided. You throw abortion in there, and suddenly it's one big convoluted mess. And you can call it a fee. You can call it a tax. You can call it whatever you want. But I want to point out, the hospitals are saying, put this fee on us. It's not like you're, you're forcing the hospitals to impose this fee. The hospitals want to pay this fee because this fee is going to more than pay for itself. By paying that fee, they're going to get the drawdown from the federal government, the match, and they're going to make that money back, and it's going to lower their uncompensated care costs. So you well, can we, call it a tax, well, we but should the people clarify, are going to be paying. I agree that most hospitals, most hospitals, not every hospital is there. Um, most Almost hospitals are probably there. One. Yeah, because they, so. they would serve to benefit from it. And, of course, we, the question would be, you know, will they pass it on to consumers? Because if they do, well, then, of course, they're going to support it. But they've said they're, they're not going to, and, and we could put some protections. It's prohibited in Brewer's language right now. It's prohibited from being passed on to the consumers, so the consumers are protected. 
So I think, again, I, again, to me, that's an argument that doesn't hold much water for me. But it, from the start of this conversation, there was always a question, is this a tax? Is this an assessment? If a tax, why does it not need a two-thirds vote? I mean, is this thing, <laughs> you guys go ahead, let's say yeah. you finally now you, get a vote, <laughs> you finally get a pass, does it go directly to court because someone says and it's a tax? Raised, and you've raised another complicated right. issue. <clears throat> is, is, is it a, what we call a 108, which requires a two-thirds vote? And uh, there are the same opinions, uh, very strong opinions on both sides of that. Uh, you'll get legal opinions that say, absolutely, it's a 108, you have to have two-thirds, and others say, oh, no, no, we've done similar things to this before, and so it's not a 108. And uh, I think at the end of the day, when something passes, it'll probably uh, probably end up end up in the courts as to whether it's a 108 or not. Well, and that's another that's reason that's some that's oppose it, is yep. because in order to get around the 108 issue, uh, the mechanism being used is to say, okay, we're, we're not going to do the tax. We're going to let somebody else do the tax. And, and some folks in the legislature, including myself, with that particular aspect of this plan, find that uh, to be unacceptable. Well, that's why the hospitals or, you know, they're, they're heavy-duty stakeholders that are uh, a part of this. And that's why they were in the initial conversations about, could, is this something that the hospitals could handle? Clearly, this would be the better, better direction than the uncompensated care, because then that would devastate um, the medical industry. Yeah, there's one, one more argument that, that uh, I don't think we touched on, and that is the, the federal debt argument, that uh, um, if we do the expansion and there's going to be $1.6 billion or whatever the number is, uh, uh, and that's money that the, uh, adds to the $16 trillion that we're in federal debt and we need to stop. It, it's not my argument, but it's it's one of the arguments. And when do, you know where does this stop? And this is where we're going to draw the line. And we're not. And we're Let me stop respond to that though, because I know you haven't made that argument, but many of my colleagues in the House have on the GOP side, and I don't see them turning down money for border security from the federal government or money for federal highway dollars. Uh, this is the first time I've ever heard anybody voice concern about money coming to Arizona. That's returning our tax investment we pay to D.C. If we don't take this money, our federal tax burden doesn't change. And our tax dollars that we pay to D.C. are going to start going to another state. Our tax dollars are going to be thrown away if we do not pursue Medicaid expansion. Last point on this. I, I, I understand the ideological and philosophical differences here and, and, and the rigidity that, that uh, promotes. However, is there, is there conversation, is there talk about what does, what does Arizona want? What do citizens want? We know what some lawmakers want. We know very loudly what they want. But, but is there a concern? I may be against this philosophically, but most in the state are for it, and thus I need to maybe bend one way or right. the other. Right. And, it, you know, when it, when it comes right down to it, you know, most of the people in Arizona, they do want to make sure that there is, uh, you know, the medical care. And there's been a big, big concern about those who are... Um, uh, single adults, disabled, individuals that really need to have good medical care. So absolutely, the question is moving forward. And we've had, a, you know, a couple of votes that have went forward, you know, to the ballot where the voters have shown this is what is needed in order to have this. So uh, I, I there, think the there, voters have already there, spoken, there, yes. There are, there are dueling polls out there now just to continue the complicated <laughs> issue. Uh, I happen to think one of the one poll that shows that the people do want this. I happen to think that's uh, uh, more valid. Uh, but there is a dueling poll that shows particularly the, the uh, uh, Republicans uh, don't want it. Uh, I don't think that poll is uh, as valid as the first one, but uh, there are dueling polls. Well, we've had two yeah. past ballot initiatives that have went forward dealing with this issue. Well, we and also the had public went forward to say, yes. On the other side. We also had Prop 106, I think it was, on the other side that yeah. said, hey, we, we have the right to be in control of our health care. Some look at this as giving up some of that control. And so there are, in addition to dueling polls, there are dueling propositions as well. Yeah. And we should mention that, again, we're talking about 133 uh, percent of poverty level expanding that for childless yes. adults, which would, again, yes. trigger matching funds from the feds, which mm -hmm. may or may not be there in the future, which is an argument regarding Another argument. Yeah, yeah. yeah but again, that's taken but, care of by, by the circuit breaker that, right. that Governor Brewer built into her proposal that is taken care of as well. Right, but when you get to that circuit breaker, who knows what happens, what the spillover. I under, we got all that. I just want to make sure yeah. we're kind of clarifying terms because I want to get into sales tax reform and TPT, which I would imagine most folks have no idea what it is or what it means, <laughs> but this is another one that's you got some loggerheads going on down Yes, well, there's two issues that are keeping us from a budget, <coughs> and the one we just talked about, the Medicaid expansion. The other one is TPT. I think we're closer to a decision on that. TPT, and just for the viewers' uh, benefit, it stands for 
a, a transaction privilege tax. So it's a privilege to, to pay, pay sales tax <laughs> right. in, in the state of Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> nice name for a sales tax, <laughs> isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. And we, we have the I know more about this than I ever wanted to know. Mm -hmm. I spent my summer vacation <laughs> in the, uh, <clears throat> on the governor's uh, task force to uh, uh, address this issue. And I think we're pretty close to uh, a really major reform bill. And it's been a long time coming, and it's once again is a very complicated issue. But we have the worst system of sales tax in the country, uh, and, yeah. and we're we're close to a reform. But it, the, the reform, though, includes this business of counties not getting. If you don't have a, a Home Depot in your county, you're not getting the point of of sale uh, right. benefit there. I mean, that sounds like that is a real sticking point. It is a really big concern. And I know, you know, again, for years we've talked about this and the fact that we do have a volatile um, uh, tax structure here within our state. And so there has to be something done about it. And I think that with that all being said, it's really important that we take into consideration of the concerns of the cities and the towns. And I think that has been the case. And so trying and to you, work on an agreement up, amongst that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And you bring up the issue of prime contracting is what you're talking right. about. And I actually right. think that's the outcome standing issue it at is. this point. It Most is. of the other issues related to auditing and collections, I, I think there's some agreement on, or at least we're yeah. very close. That is the sticking yeah. point. Various yeah. iterations have been proposed. They all have their weaknesses. I do think at the end of the day we're going to get something. This is actually something I think both of our caucuses agree yeah. needs to be. Mm -hmm. So, and I think I agree everything, on something. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't been, you know, quite frankly, the sexier conversation yeah. to talk yeah. about. But certainly, it's been one that, if out of all the conversations, I think it has has come up with more agreement. But it has been it has been one where folks in Maricopa and folks in Fountain Hills and folks who live in some of these communities where yeah. they don't have sure. Uh, sure. those kinds of construction and lumber Agreed. yards, mm -hmm. they're they're wondering who's going to pave the streets. Agreed. So and I think I think that that issue has to be resolved before this moves forward. Yeah. Yeah. There's no yeah. way the original language around prime contracting will go forward. But, you know, to your point, John, I mean, you, you talked about spending the summer learning about this, and, <laughs> and I've done the same thing. I've been calling for sales tax reform for about five years. I actually called for this committee four years ago. Uh, I'm very excited about this, which I never thought I would say I was very excited about tax policy in my life. <laughs> but it's, we still have a long ways to go, and, and I want to see this thing move forward. But after this, we still have to continue to fix our sales tax code. We have way too many exemptions on the books, and our sales tax is way too high. If we close those exemptions out and lower our sales tax, we make our state much more competitive, much friendlier to small businesses, and a much more even playing field for everybody in the state. Uh, this is a good start, but we have yeah, we'll, to keep moving forward. We'll save that one for, yes. yeah, sure. for the next show. We'll talk about the next Yeah, show. the next, yeah. The next <laughs> go around. Um, let's get to CPS funding. Now, we had some emergency me measure that went through. Yep. Uh, we've got, uh, what, 4.4 .4 million that went through or something along was it, was something something along, along those lines. And, yeah. uh, obviously, there's, well, the governor's office wants, I think, uh, 50 million or so. Mm -hmm. Will we, is, is that a sticking point or is that just a numbers kind of thing? No, I, I don't think it's a sticking point. I think it's a, a numbers. We may have some quibbling about the numbers, but I think uh, that uh, both the legislature, at least Republican leadership and the governor's office are very, very close uh, on uh, what would in essence add another 150 employees to CPS. Uh, and so the only thing right now is exactly how much money will that be. But I think, I think we're very close. Yeah, and those employees would you know, specifically be towards caseworkers, which is something that's yes. really needed. We already added the 50 in there. And one of the things we wanted to make sure of was as we move forward with the budget and the conversation, that was not forgotten. Mm -hmm. And when we had the, the task force, the governor's task force that I, I had the privilege of serving on, um, with that, there's there's lots of concern about making sure that we're doing something about this big bear of, of CPS. Well, and, and just to clarify, not all of the $50 million is for CPS alone. Right. There are other services involved. And so some of those numbers may be negotiated. But I think John's right. I think uh, we're in agreement that CPS, in particular caseworkers, mm -hmm. that's certainly the top priority. And also, too, we have to not forget about prevention as a whole. And, and throughout the years of the, you know, the budget crisis that has went on over the last several years, we have to make sure that there are dollars put back uh, to make sure that they're preventative mechanisms so that people will not end up with their children in CPS. Yes. Other major headlines of the uh, legislative session so far uh, involve gun issues, and uh, we, could, we could spend an hour uh, talking about <laughs> yeah. those. But the most recent was this gun buyback yeah. uh, a bill. Thoughts on this? Why was this necessary? Uh, well, what, the, what it was was just a, a, a reform of where we already were in terms of gun buyback. There was a loophole that allowed cities uh, to do what they were doing for recently, what the city of Phoenix was doing, and uh, destroying, so this, destroying yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this 
uh, close that loophole. It didn't didn't create a new policy. It closed the loophole in the current policy. So yeah. I introduced a bill this session that would have allowed cities to do whatever they wanted to do with the gun. And, and uh, I mean, this is a mandate on local law enforcement. What we passed was the exact opposite of what I introduced, which forces the cities now to sell these guns back, put them back on the street. That's a mandate on local law enforcement, mandate on cities. We're telling them how to manage their own communities. But what's more amazing about this to me, if you think about this, if you're a gun owner, and I'm a gun owner, support the Second Amendment, have my whole life, but I think you need some common sense gun laws in the state, and we're heading the wrong way. If you think about this bill as it passed now, if I were to go to the city of Phoenix with my gun and say to the city, here's my weapon, I'm the owner, destroy it for me, they cannot destroy that weapon. That gun has more rights than the owner has in the state now. But wouldn't, and wouldn't that's, the, that's wouldn't the argument be, though, if you want the gun destroyed, destroy it? It doesn't matter. The point is, we prevented a gun owner, a city, to work together, whoever maybe We're preventing a city and the cops in that city from making the best possible decision to protect Which their is, communities. And you know what, that's some of the argument that we, we hear on a regular basis, you know, on the other side of the aisle from us, and I'll do respect, as it relates to the federal government not jumping in and, 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 and jumping into state business. Well, as the state, we jumped right into the, the cities and towns. And with that being the case, you know, this recent buyback, I, I heard stories of individuals that pulled up uh, that were involved in domestic violence situations and wanted to, you know, get up that, the weapon out of you know reach and out of touch of, of having harm. So with that, you know, again, it's up to the cities and the towns. And so to come in as the state and say we're going to go ahead and regulate what the cities and towns do, that was a big concern. Same Not to mention all these other issues we have. And boy, that was a big, hard pressing one that we move forward with. But, but last point on this again: Why is something like this necessary? Well, I think whether it's necessary is in the eye of the beholder. There was a loophole that uh, a city was taking advantage of, and the idea was to close that loophole. And you're right. If, uh, if someone wants to destroy it, they can still destroy it. This hasn't really prevented an end from happening. It's just saying that, that law enforcement will uh, sell the gun uh, if, if it's brought to them. But it's not uh, I, just, I want to point something out, though, because, again, there's this weird mindset taking place in, in the political debate, not just here in Arizona, but in the country, around weapons. And it's almost like people that are pro NRA are almost attaching personalities and their own character to weapons. Weapons are weapons. They're just like a toaster. They're just like a. You TV. mean you haven't named your They're weapon? They're an appliance. <laughs> you don't want to know that. <laughs> uh, so, but the point is, there, there's no need for this, and, and, and it's a good question. And, and with all due respect, I don't think you actually answered the question. There is no need for this because if you want to, if you want to keep your weapon, keep your weapon. If you want to have it destroyed, have it destroyed. But again, why are we telling people who have ownership of their guns what they can and can't do with it, and local law enforcement who know the streets that they patrol what they can and cannot do to keep their streets safe? We only have a few minutes left. And I, with this in mind, and I think it's a good uh, leaving on the gun issue, overall, the impression you think the legislative session so far, this go around, is leaving on voters. I mean, um, some would look at, at the gun buyback program as being a, a black mark on the, on the legislature. And they're, 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 there's a disconnect there. and they don't. We hear that a lot. But what do you think the impression the legislature is making on Arizona? Right? What do you think that is, this session? Yeah, well, I think the impression w w that we're making is uh, on the people is probably not fair in this regard, uh, and that is that we've got these huge issues that, that are incredibly complicated, and we haven't dealt with them yet, but, but we are. We're working on it. We'll get them done. In the meanwhile, we've gone about our business in a very professional way, very civilly, uh, uh, the, probably the most, uh, Leah and I have the most experience, uh, uh, the most civil in my nine years experience, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, we get a lot, and we get a lot done. Uh, uh, the wheels of government the, which is most of what we do. Most of what we do isn't the big sexy stuff. Most of what we do is the, is the grind it out, to make the wheels of government turn. Uh, uh, and we've done a very good job of that. But that's not the impression that people will have. What do you think the right. impression and folks I, have? And you know what? Uh, there, there are so many different things of, of priorities that the public is concerned about. Education, for instance. I mean, wanting to restore things like full-day kindergarten so that families are not having to go to public schools and literally pay for all day of a kindergarten. Making sure that we have the Medicaid expansion. Making sure that the budget gets out on time. And hopefully, as we move forward, things will happen quickly by the end of next week. Other than that, I think the, you know, the impression of what we're doing and how we're taking the priority of the people 
um, seriously may start fading. We've got about 20 seconds. The perception people have? Yes. Probably not good. We're yeah. all politicians. Nobody likes politicians. So. <laughs> well. Can I just add, we're disconnected. On the issues, the legislature is not reflective of what Arizonans want, and that's a direct result of the policies being driven down there right now. All right, we've got to stop it right there. My goodness, a good conversation. Good to have yeah. you all here. We Thank appreciate you, it. Good to be here. Yeah. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's a journalist roundtable. We'll get the latest on some of the issues we discussed tonight, including Medicaid expansion, and we'll look at another favorable court decision for a proposed tribal casino near Glendale. That's Friday on the journalist's roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.